The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, far flung reaches reached, abysmal depths unabyssed. The lands of the ice and snow with the midnight sun shuts off hot springs flow after major leaks. They ought to consider a tankless solution, we say. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We talk with Reich E. Spohr this time on the podcast. Reich's latest entry in the Arenaverse science fiction series is now out, and that book is Challenges of the Deeps. This is a big-time adventure-oriented science fiction with echoes of Doc Smith's Lensman and Skylark books and, and much more, and Wright will tell us all about that. We also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. There is only one mass market we're putting out this month, but it's a great one. Sailing in on March winds, riding a magical kite of the imagination, and also hitching rides on big trucks going to the booksellers. That book is Ring of Fire 4, and it's now out. It's a rampaging horde of rollicking and idea-packed alternate history tales written by today's hottest science fiction writers and edited by Eric Flint. The Ring of Fire idea is this. After a cosmic accident sets the modern-day West Virginia town of Grantsville down in war-torn 17th century Europe, these everyday resourceful Americans have to adapt or be trod into the dust of the past. So let's do the time warp again with stories by Eric Flint, David Bren, David Carrico, Virginia DeMarcy, Charles E. Gannon, and more. Ring of Fire 4, edited by Eric Flint, is now at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Reich E. Spohr to the podcast. Hello, Reich. Hey, how are you doing, Tony? Pretty good. Uh, Reich E. Spohr is the author of Bane books, including Contemporary Fantasy, Digital Night, and its sort of transfiguration into the greatly expanded Paradigms Lost. Reich is also the creator of epic fantasy The Balanced Sword series, with entries Phoenix Rising, Phoenix in Shadow, and Phoenix Ascendant. He's the author of the uh, of Polychrome, which uh, maybe I'd better let you explain what that uh, that book is about, right? It's a really interesting concept. Well, it's basically a uh, adult novel set in the world of L. Frank Baum's Oz. Um, Baum wrote 14 Oz books. Um, starting, of course, with the famous Wizard of Oz. And um, it was one of my greatest inspirations. And one day I suddenly was struck with an inspiration that wouldn't let me go to write a story based in that world, um, focused around um, Polychrome, who is the daughter of the rainbow and a major character in three of the Oz books. And uh, so I, I did so, trying to reconcile uh, Baum's original stories with something for a more adult audience. Um, and then I kickstarted it because, uh, you know, I, I submitted it to many different publishers and all of them felt that, some of them thought it was, was great and at least one of them took two and a half years to finally say no, mainly because it didn't fit in any of the categories they really promoted. So I kickstarted it and that was successful and I published it. Well, that's super cool. And you can find that on Amazon and elsewhere, um, your website. What is your website, by the way? It's uh, GrandCentralArena.com. Yeah. Let me go on with Eric Flint. Reich is the co-author of the hard science fiction Boundary series, including Boundary, Threshold, Portal, then jumping ahead a few years in the series time frame, Castaway Planet and Castaway Odyssey, which are very fun books. He's the author of upcoming Amazingly Strange Fantasy <laughs> that I find delightful, Princess Oliara. <laughs> And uh, we'll certainly be talking about that more in the future. And Reich is the author of the science fiction Arenaverse series with entries Grand Central Arena, Spheres of Influence, and now at Booksellers Everywhere, Challenges of the Deeps. 
Right. Uh, you've alluded to the fact that challenges of the deeps and the arena books and the arena verse books in general are very much influenced by the great golden age work of E.E. E. Doc Smith, creator of the Skylark series and the Lensman series. Um, in fact, you put him in the dedication. Uh, can you explain a little bit what that means? Well, Doc Smith, in many ways, is one of the major fathers of grand-scale science fiction. The Skylark books, Skylark of Space, which is the first one, was published in 1929, been written about 10 years before then. And it was really the first science fiction novel, as opposed to some fantasies, that went beyond the bounds of the solar system. And overall, Doc has so many firsts to his credit that it'd be almost impossible for him to mention them in a reasonable amount of time up to and including him from uh, one of his Lensman books, inspiring the basic concepts that were then used by the U.S. Navy to do the modern um, command center concept. Um, for me, I was first introduced to him when I was 11, when one of my teachers gave me this battered old cigarette burned copy of Second Stage Lensman. And it's one of the greatest injections of... of sense of wonder I have ever had. It, the sheer scope of his works, the, you know, he didn't deal on a small scale, either in power or in terms of, the, of good and evil. You know, I always write with good guys and bad guys, partly because I, I just like it that way. It's the real world, it's really murky and gray, and I like having my books even if there's appearances of gray, that there really are some good guys and really are some bad guys. Um, and Doc was the greatest of those. He inspired dozens and dozens of other authors and continues to do so all the way down the line. Many of Bain's authors, I'm sure, not only recognize the name, but would admit that he was one of their inspirations. A direct part in uh, the Arenaverse, of course, is the inclusion of Mark C. Duquesne, as a character, he is deliberately named and patterned after the main villain from the Skylark series. And I actually was very nervous about doing that and contacted the uh, Smith estate. And they were extremely kind. Uh, um, Kim Trestrell was uh, uh, very kind enough to say that he thought it sounded good. And then when he read the first book, uh, he was uh, very complimentary about it which is very good for me because not only do they basically give their blessing for it, but it was the closest I could get to actually handing it to Doc, Doc himself and saying, here, you inspired me to do all this stuff. Um, I, I hope this lives up somewhat to what you'd expect. Yeah, that's really cool. It, and I think that many, uh, many would agree it does. Um, we have gotten to the point in the Arenaverse stories where some major, major revelations are afoot. Um, and I really, uh, I'm, I love the Challenges of the Deeps book as because you find out so many things. Um, but what has brought us to this point? Can you give us an outline of the story up to the beginning of Challenges of the Deeps? Um, also, I want to mention that you do have this excellent short story on Bain.com website at the moment, Preparations and Alliances. And that uh, is available and it's sort of a prequel to challenges. Um, and that will be available after it goes down from the website in the free short stories, 2017 free ebook anthology you can get at the Bain free library and at Bain eBooks. So, uh, anyway, uh, give us a, sort of tell us where we are as the story begins in, in, uh, challenges of the deeps. All right. Let's see how, how quickly I can summarize this and make sense of it. Um, it's really complicated in the year 20, <laughs> Full of imagination and amazingly diverse. <laughs> Thank you. And the year 2375 is when it all started. The uh, solar system has reached a point where it is basically a post-scarcity society. They can, you know, they have sufficient energy and complex enough nanotechnology that basically. Nobody has to work for anything. If they want to eat, they can synthesize it and synthesize exactly what they want. We're not talking about eating soy or, or other synthetics as we would think of them, but they have ways of actually replicating steaks and fresh fruit and everything in an efficient way using nothing but whatever the raw materials you might have, have lying around are. Um, 
This means that governments as we know them are mostly gone. There are figurehead places that are still called, say, the United States. But people are basically independent. They can do what they want, when they want, and uh, no one prevents them from doing so unless they're hurting other people. Um, there is a very small effective government um, which is composed of basically an oversight group and a very small military that deals with the disasters that can't be dealt with on a personal scale. Anyway, during uh, in 2375, uh, Simon Sanderson, a physicist, has, he believes, come up with a way to travel faster than light. But funny things are happening with his probes. They're not behaving exactly the way he expects them to. So finally, he decides the only way that he's going to find out what's going on is to actually go up there himself, you know, with, with living people. Well, he needs a crew to do this, creates a, uh, you know, designs a ship and say, you know, with the help of other people and says, okay, I need eight people. Actually, he originally wants seven, but the eighth person gets uh, uh, brought in the last minute. And um, among those that he chooses are Mark Duquesne and Ariane Austin. Ariane is a pilot. She's a racing pilot. She does this for fun, for for the chills and thrills of it, and for the reputation, um, because she doesn't have to work specifically for it, but she's one of the best in the system. She's chosen just in case something goes wrong with the automatics. Now, they don't expect that to ever happen. The automatics are faster than human beings. They're more perceptive. They're tougher. Nothing could go wrong. Well, they make the jump, and everything goes wrong. Not only do the automated controls shut down, so does every artificial intelligence on board the ship, and so does the nuclear reactor. So suddenly she is flying a ship using manual controls, which almost nobody knows how to use, except her, and everything on the ship is dead and running on auxiliary power. To make it worse, most people in that era have what are called ice ages, uh, which are artificial intelligences that are basically embedded in them that help them do everything. It's sort of like having a best friend, secretary, and and um, a tutor in your head all at once. Um, and people grow up with these people, with these AI people, and they are people. They have full personalities and everything. They grow up with them with the, from the time they're children. So when these AIs suddenly <laughs> shut off, it's a tremendous trauma for most of the people on board the ship. Only two of them don't normally have embedded AIs, Dupain and Ariane. That's what saves them. Ariane keeps her head and is able to keep them from crashing into a wall that has appeared in the middle of black space in front of them. After exploring, they discover that they have come out inside a gigantic structure about 20,000 kilometers across called a sphere. And... Within the sphere, they suddenly encounter alien life forms. And bizarrely, they can understand them when they're talking. They've already seen some weird stuff happening, but this pushes it far beyond the ordinary weird, too. They have no way of understanding how this is happening. Well, one of those strange creatures, after it turns out that there's a squabble going on between the ones they encounter, they manage to convince the uh, ones they're attacking this isolated member of their group to go. And the isolated one calls himself Orphan and offers to give them assistance. They find out that they are in something called the arena, and that this 20,000-kilometer sphere is nothing but a tiny dot in the middle of what is a construct that apparently duplicates in light-years-sized miniature the entirety of the universe. And it has rules. They have to play by those rules. And if they don't play by those rules, they may never go home. They discover that, let's see, I have to hit the high points here because I could go on for hours and describe yeah. it. Well, the, um, one of the main points is that the discovery of FTL leads species here, right? Well... Or something like yes, that. Yes, what happens is that it, it alerts them to knowing that we exist. And once we enter the arena, our sphere in the arena 
provides a possible portal for them to enter our solar system. Mm -hmm. Now, everything within the arena is run on the arena's rules, which include challenges. Most challenges are formal ones where you say, hey, I challenge your faction um, to do to compete with me in some way, and if we win, you get this, and if we lose, you get that. Um, the challenges can have stakes up to and going beyond even entire solar systems. So we aren't talking about just potentially gambling away your own money. We're talking about you potentially gambling away your entire species' um, resources. With the exception of your home system, you can't lose that to a challenge, fortunately, because there are system, there are uh, species that could have done so because they're having bad runs of luck. Now, fortunately, the human beings make a really good and spectacular showing. First, they kick one of the nastiest species in the arena, the Molothos, off of the exterior of their sphere um, when they discover that the Molothos have just landed a scouting party there. This turns out to equate, from the point of view of the arena, to winning a challenge. This gives humanity official standing. It also, of course, makes the Molothos pissed at them and causes them to declare war. Fortunately, there were no survivors from the invading party, so they don't know where we are yet. But they will be able to find out, and of course, as you know, they eventually do in challenges. Um, meanwhile, we establish a number of other uh, we we survive a couple of other challenges, ultimately uh, finishing up in Grand Central Arena with Ariane Austin facing the Shade Weaver Amaskarayo. The Shade Weavers being something like really creepy magicians, even though everyone suspects that really they're using super high tech tricks, basically arena mediated tricks that they're allowed to use and that other people aren't. After Grand Central Arena, in spheres of influence, there were other challenges, other difficulties. The major thrust of the story, though, was on Ariane Austin, who ended up being decided by the arena, decided, hey, you're leader of the faction of humanity. A ridiculous title, but from the point of view of the arena, it's absolutely true. She is now the leader of the entirety of humanity. And Honestly, she didn't want this position. She barely wanted the whole idea of being captain, which she ended up getting stuck in because nobody else on the ship was really suited for it. Um, so the uh, series of influence is more about her coming to terms with the fact that she is the leader and she has to deal with being the leader, um, ultimately culminating in her being kidnapped by another faction, the Blessed to Serve, and having to be simultaneously help rescue herself and be rescued um, by others who pursue the blessed into the arena, the, the deep areas of the arena, in order to rescue her. And that's basically where we end up with Challenge of the Deep. She succeeded in, uh, they've succeeded in escaping the blessed to serve and forcing them to pay up for their failure, and she's also established a political solution to the idea of having one person ruling the uh, solar system. Behind and around all of this, of course, is the legacy of something that happened 50 years before in the solar system, the Hyperion Project, which is, or was, a bizarre attempt by a bunch of people who basically were a, a geeky faction of people within the solar system who have access to technology we can barely imagine right now, uh, to replicate all of the cool heroes of myth and fiction. And it kind of worked. And then it fell apart because you create a whole bunch of synthetic Superman. You really think that you're going to keep them caged? So it all fell apart. They were, they're real people Fivers. in sort of fantasy worlds, right? Is it? The way the Hyperion... Yes, they were real people in, in virtual worlds, but the Hyperion design was such that they really believed these worlds were real. The worlds, because they can do perfect VR, felt real, acted real, and everything. Mm -hmm. So, as far as they were concerned, they were real. Their worlds were real, their friends were real, everything, all the adventures they had were real, and then suddenly they discover, no, it's all fake, 
and you were basically built as some bunch of geeks amusement who thought, oh, this would be cool. Well, yeah, it is cool, but you made real people, and you caged them up somewhere in, a, in an artificial environment. So it fell apart in a disaster, but there are several surviving Hyperians, as they are called, and they're crucial to the plot, one of them being, of course, Mark Duquesne, which is why he shares that name with a fictional character. He was made based somewhat on that character. And that legacy of Hyperion extends throughout all three books and has a very large influence in challenges. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it's sort of a key to a lot of things. Um, yes. Well, since you mentioned um, the Blessed to Serve and uh, it just uh, your alien factions are just super cool to me. <laughs> they are. I mean, there's only there's millions of them, but but we have a few that are sort of our main antagonist or or allies. Um, can you tell us about um, say what are the blessed to serve? What are the analytics? What are the vengeance? What is vengeance? The blessed to serve are one of the general adversaries to begin with. They're dangerous in the sense that what we see are the intelligent servitors of what are really gigantic artificial intelligences of incredible power. But, as I mentioned before, the arena has rules. One of the rules is no artificial intelligences, except possibly the arena itself, if it isn't being run by living beings, but an AI. But in that case, the arena suffers no rivals. So, it has had to allow, you see, many years ago, thousands of years ago, basically the liberated, the, the uh, blessed to serve an ordinary race of beings that had made their own automated, you know, artificial intelligences, and the AIs took over. And they made the people into their pacified servitor race. Well, they had to give them more freedom because they found that if they tried to control them when they went into the arena, they just shut down. So the poor AIs are stuck in the regular universe having to work through sometimes unreliable living beings. But still, most of the Blessed to Serve are very loyal to the minds, as they call them. And that makes them extremely dangerous because they are coordinated. They are very highly educated in all areas and capable of being upgraded in knowledge by a mind for any particular function. The, um, the worst of the factions in terms of hardest to get along with are the Molothos. Molothos are my classic, and not the classic bug-eyed monster. Um, their general appearance was sort of inspired by the uh, one of the forms of the creature Destroya in Godzilla vs. Destroyer. <laughs> they have got seven sort of spider-like legs and a sort of centaur-like insectoid um, central body with two praying mantis-style claws, as well as smaller manipulators around the head. They are very nice people to their own people, very considerate, loyal, competent, and they're total xenophobes, and they hate every other species out there with an absolute passion. They think of them as lesser beings and will kill you if they are given one-tenth of an excuse. Hmm. These are the people that we manage to insult by kicking them off our sphere. There are um, some uh, interlude chapters in Challenges that are from the from their perspective, which are really cool and fun. Um, it's amazing how you get inside <laughs> this insectoid head of theirs. Well, that was what I was trying to do was make sure that we knew that these were still people, that they weren't like one-dimensional killing machines, that, they, that from their point of view, they are people. They may not be very nice people from our point of view, although they're very nice people to themselves, but they're, they're people. And ultimately, that does give us a bit of hope that maybe there's a way out of this besides wiping out their entire species, which would be one hell of a problem considering that they have been in the arena for countless years, have tens of thousands of worlds. How are you going to wipe them out? It's essentially impossible. 
Um, let's see. Orphan is a very important character. He is, or at least was up until the end of Spheres of Influence, the sole member of the faction of the Liberated. The Liberated are the same species as the Blessed to Serve, um, but they're the ones that have gone renegade and said, screw you, minds, I'm going on my own way. There used to be many more of them. Orphan is the only survivor, and he's been alone for a couple of thousand years at least. That tells you how formidable he is. He is also fairly opportunistic, self-serving, but he's also one of the most charming, dramatic, and competent people that they meet, and overall he's more humanity's ally than he's been our um, obstacle. He has a lot of secrets. What other species? <laughs> well, secrets are what the arena is built on, as he says more than once. If you have something, if you have knowledge that other people don't, don't have, that's really one of the greatest pieces of, of bargaining that you have with them. I know this, you know something I want, we trade knowledge. Now, money, well, there is money within the arena itself, but ultimately, people are looking for, I want to know something that I didn't know before. So secrets are the single biggest currency in the arena. Yeah, that's, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the books are about um, keeping secrets and, and using secrets to get other, you know, trading, basically. Um, they're about commerce, intellectual commerce, um, in a way that... that intellectual that, commerce and intellectual warfare. Yeah. Having a secret, which is a weapon, as, you know, they, as happens um, both... Um, basically, it happens in all three of the books. For example, Ariane's climactic confrontation with Hamas Garayo. She only wins that because she has put together a whole bunch of disparate pieces of information and come to a realization that nobody else in the arena has. So she's able to do what nobody else has done in the known history of the arena, perform a self-awakening and trigger the same powers in her that both the Shade Weavers and the other um, strange faction, the Faith, have. This gives her a way out of the battle that otherwise was hopeless. And what? there's others, uh, as you know, in the other books that are similar to this, where yeah. I know something that you don't know turns out to be the difference between winning and losing. Um, well, tell us a little bit about the Shadow Weavers as well, because they're creepy. The Shade Weavers are... Shade Weavers. They act like magicians. They like the creepy... Um, mystique of their power, and their power is indeed creepy itself. It effectively looks like magic. The assumption within the books, by almost everyone there, is that they're just given, for some reason, the arena allows them access to some of the arena's tricks. And the arena is assumed to be just super tech, working on the level of manipulating space-time itself. But what it boils down to is the Shade Weavers can do things like throw lightning bolts and telekinesis things and you know, confuse your mind and do all, all the kinds of things you expect a wizard to do. And they aren't really so much a species and not even so much a faction as a brotherhood. They recruit different members of different species. Usually at, they like to have at least one member from all the species they know of. Um, and they can act fairly independently with outside of the uh, faction as long as they don't do anything to damage their their group itself, their reputation. Um, this makes them different than most of the other factions, which are usually focused around some more coherent concept. Most of the factions aren't individual species. The Blessed are, pretty much, and the Molothos are, except for their slave species. But most of the others, like the analytic, the analytic is focused around scientific progress, understanding the universe, and so on. And so they recruit all sorts of people from all sorts of species who are interested in this sort of thing. The Vengeance believe that the creators of the arena are really the enemies of all other species, and so they recruit anyone who has the same feeling that the arena itself is basically unfair. Now, or worse than unfair, malevolent even, and so on. Most of the uh, most of the factions are that. The only other s faction that's really not the same, aside from the power brokers, which we don't see too much of, are the Genasi. Genasi are interesting because they are the only 
um, at least the only acknowledged, intelligent species that evolved within the arena space. All the others are from our universe who popped in once they used a faster than light drive. But the Genasi evolved there. That means they aren't considered natives. Or they, they're considered natives, but they're not considered people because they didn't do all the things that make them citizens of the arena by the arena's rules. Um, the beginning of challenges, of course, uh, we, we get to the point where the Genasi are going to try to gain that citizenship for themselves because they were given a chance to do so. Um, but they are, despite the fact they're quite small creatures, um, they are one of the most formidable sets of warriors in the entire arena space. And they have been excellent mercenaries and uh, guards. Uh, we get to see more of one of them in detail, both in challenges and in preparations and alliances, the short story you mentioned. Yeah, he came back to uh, to our solar system to, to in the in the short story to kind of talk with them um, with Earth's Council of Leaders or whatever. The name of that one is to yeah his his name is Tanuvan, the uh, the leader of the Genasi. What are the um, races against? Him? So we we know some of the rules about AI. What are some of the what are the technological and and warfare limitations uh, of the arena. What are the weapons and the ships like? Well, one of the arena's other major limitations is thou shalt not use high energy generation things like nuclear power. You can't use nukes, you can't use antimatter reactors, you can't bring in singularity generators, any of that stuff. What you can do is store a lot of power in superconductor batteries and drive around with that. Or if you wanted to, you could use internal combustion engines or sail on the, on the winds or whatever, because the interior of the arena is filled with air. It is not filled with, it is not vacuum. It's mostly livable space within the arena. So you literally can sail on the winds of the arena and go places as though you're using a sailing ship. Most people, of course, aren't just going to do that. They're going to have a high-tech powered ship. And the kinds of weapons they'll use would be missiles and, and beam weapons and cannon and things of that nature. Uh, nothing ridiculous in general you know, from the point of view of technology. You know, there's, there's no faster than light phasers or photon torpedoes per se, but there are big missiles and heavy, powerful beams of energy and uh, cannon and so on. One rule that the arena enforces specifically is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that there can be absolutely no military um, troop movements, materiel, et cetera, through the space of what's called Nexus Arena, which is the center from the point of view of operations of the arena, and it is the area that everyone goes to to begin with. It has the most connections to other spheres. So this reduces, uh, this, this limits your logistical movement of material. You can't just shove it through the easy way. You sometimes have to do it a long way around. And the, the, um, the arena controls, uh, the arena, I mean, you give the example in the book that, um, that when somebody loses a challenge, a species loses a challenge, the arena can just physically relocate entire populations of planets, re change the alignments and the compositions of planets to, to favor new species, et cetera. It's, I mean, it isn't that, um, that the AIs haven't tried to get in there. It's that this thing is just way too powerful. It's, it's immensely powerful, right? It is, it is the, there was a quote, I believe, from one of Ian Banks' um, novels, where the culture mind, one of the culture minds says, um, "We are, we are nearer unto gods and on the far side." That would describe the arena in spades. The arena is the closest thing to omnipotent and omniscient that you will ever see. Um, it obviously has limits or rules that it plays by. So there may be ways to trick it or get around rules, but even those getting around things probably have rules associated with them. 
But within whatever the rules are, there is very, very, very little that the arena cannot do. As you say, it can rearrange, it can, if you win a solar system in challenge, well, you can't leave the original species there. You're not, gonna, you're not going to hand them your people. So the arena takes the entire population, moves it to another appropriate location, distributes it if necessary across your other spheres, however, however it appears most, uh, most reasonable to the arena. And it does try to help. It's not going to be dickish about it. And then it will fix up the um, solar system to be appropriate for the uh, new owners sort of like taking your house and making sure that it's all ready after you've sold it. Except the arena does this with entire solar systems. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how powerful it is. Yeah. And what are... Um, have tried and they've failed. Yeah. And what, what are challenges? What's the purpose of this? I mean, because this is the main thing that goes on. <laughs> the purpose? Well, perhaps we don't know. That's what a lot of people are... Large purposes and small purposes. The... The small purpose is that this is how all the species in the arena interact. It, the way things are set up, it makes it difficult, though not impossible, for you to have wars with your with you with the other species. You can, and it does happen. We even see it, but it's really hard to carry off. And you're you're talking about assaulting people in their home solar systems. They've got the home field advantage that's huge. So the challenges are the way in which differences are resolved in which people gain status, which is really really the big thing in the arena. How do people view you? Do they trust you? Are you strong enough to defend what's yours and those that associate themselves with you? Uh, have you shown weakness? Have you shown dishonesty? Um, have you shown innocence and cluelessness that can be you know, taken advantage of? Um, all these things show up in the challenges. The bigger question, why is it set up for you to do these challenges? What does it do for the arena? That we don't know. We don't know why the arena does that, and there are several theories. Um, the vengeance is, is that it's basically a trap set up by the super powerful beings that first created the arena, who are called the Void Builders in general. Nobody knows what they really were. So the Void Builders is the term that most use. Um, from the Vengeance's point of view, the Void Builders built the arena as a trap. Anyone who tries to use Faster Than Light is caught in it. They're forced to follow these rules. The challenges keep them distracted and fighting each other and never getting to the point that they're organized enough and powerful enough to challenge the Void Builders themselves. The Faith are on the opposite end of the spectrum. They think that the Void Builders are not just like us, that the Void Builders are perhaps representatives of the divine, or perhaps were the divine themselves, that the arena is a testing ground of God. And the challenges are the way in which they are ultimately going to be sorted to the point at which they can finally emerge into God's kingdom, whatever it might be. And other people are, I don't know why it's there. We'll just have to research it. That's the analytics point of view. Mm. I'm not making any theories about this until I have information. And the analytics have a hell of a lot of information they've built up because they've been there <laughs> th tens of thousands of years. Around for tens of thousands of years. And they deal in secrets. They deal in knowledge. Yes, the analytics seems to be one of the least hostile factions, but that's partly because... Pretty much everyone knows that if you're dumb enough to start a spitting match with the analytic, it probably won't turn out well for you because they know things. And knowing things is the single biggest weapon in the arena. Mm. Well, let's talk about the story uh, a little bit. Um, we begin the book with Ariane uh, Austin returning to the arena from, from our solar system. She's now the official leader as appointed by humanity, uh, the human leaders um, of the faction of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of plot threads immediately set off uh, and set in motion. First is um, the Genesee are going to have to issue a challenge in order to get a sphere of their own. These are the species that evolved within the arena, and they don't have their own sphere. Um, 
And this takes, can you just set up the beginning of that? This takes the dire turn when they challenge the vengeance and the vengeance kind of tries to turn the table on them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's yet another example of how even when you think that you've got everything set up, that usually going up against a faction, especially one of the great factions like the Vengeance, nothing can be taken for granted. Tanuvan of the Genasi goes up, delivers the challenge, and since this is a very special challenge, the uh, the challenge party is, isn't allowed, as they normally would be, to say, nope, not taking it. So he challenges the Vengeance, and Selpa'at of the Vengeance says, all right, we accept, and then takes advantage of the loophole that you can choose any champion that you want to represent you in a challenge, as long as they're willing to go along with it or they've sub or they've contracted for it. Well, Tanuvan had forgotten that in the terms of his last contract with the Vengeance included that he was going to be willing to work for them in a challenge of their choosing. So Selpa says, you, Tanuvan, will represent us against your own fa against the Genasi. Now, the first reaction that Ariane says is that, well, gee, then all he has to do is sit down and do nothing, and the other guy wins. The problem is that he can't because it's his profession. He's a professional challenge. He's a, he's a challenge master. He has to try his best. And, in fact, since now he'd be working against his best, he has to try better than his best. He has to show how good he is now that he's been chosen as the champion on the other side. Well, not to be outdone, Benuvin says, fine. Sun Wukong of humanity, will you be our champion? Will you take the challenge for us? And Wukong accepts. Both sides end up in the space of five minutes going, wait, what? Hold on. So uh, tell us a little bit about Wukong, who's an incredibly fun character. He reminds me a little bit of, uh, well, you, you often have... Uh, have a have an odd animal like character that is uh, like a pop pop lock in uh, in the uh, balanced sword, the balanced edge yes. uh, books. Um, balanced sword. Balanced sword. Sorry. And the um, it, tell us a little bit about him and about the racing chance challenge that they're going to engage in. So Wu Kong is um, also one of the remaining Hyperians a friend of Mark Decane's. He was, uh, the, the Hyperians were generally, you had to, you could only make one Hyperion of any given universe. There were a few exceptions, about two men. met. The problem with Wukong, which is one name for the Monkey King, he's called Son Goku in um, Japan, he's, a variant of him is Hanuman in India. The problem is that there are literally hundreds of versions of him. Well, what happened with Wukong was that Basically, there came down to a debate, and they took a whole bunch of them and combined them to one because, sorry, we're not going to have a dozen different Wukongs running around. One. So they fused a whole bunch. So he's a combination of many different versions of the Monkey King. Overall, he's a short, relatively speaking, he's about five foot, five foot one or so, um, with a short guy with um, rather spiky reddish, red black hair. Covered with uh, very fine fur, he has, of course, a monkey's tail. He's got claws and fangs, but overall, he's an innocent, cheerful kind of guy, unless you really piss him off. But he was designed as, based on the various versions of him, all of them share certain characteristics, and one of them is they are the very best warrior of their world. They are incredibly talented, tough, and fast. Um... So Wukong is an ideal choice for the racing part of racing chance. Um, racing chance, which is the particular type of challenge that the Vengeance choose uh, to put the Genasi in, um, is composed of two pieces. One of them is a obstacle race on a grand scale, where basically the racers are going through multiple different environments, ranging from um, steep mountain forests to water to floating no gravity fields filled with uh, you know spinning boulders and stuff, desert, 
and finally ending in a complex maze inside a gargantuan building. Um, the other half of it is the chance part, and that is a game that can be sort of thought of as a cross between a collectible card game and poker. And the players in that game, Duquesne is the one on our side, the Vengeance choose another expert player of the game for their side. Um, the players in those games make bets and gain points if they win, you know, lose points if they don't. And they can apply points that they have to throwing obstacles in the way of the racers. So the winner of the challenge is either whenever one of the racers crosses the finish line or if one of the players runs permanently out of points to play with. Um, at which point, of course, the other player wins. That's the basic challenge. Yeah. So there's uh, there's two competitors working together in uh, in the race. And, and both sides, yes, both yeah. sides. They have the racer and the the card player. The card player can talk to the racer and give them warning of things that they want to do. As long as it's general, they can't tell them detailed information. Um, and the racer is doing the main work of the the challenge, but how well the uh, card player does will determine how hard their part is going to be. Because one who somebody who's very lucky, of course, can start throwing all sorts of obstacles in the way of the opposing racer. Yeah. Well, now, maybe now would be a good time to talk about uh, Duquesne and who he is, and I mean, I, I sort of picture him as uh, as um, for one thing, a riverboat gambler. I don't know what does he have a mustache. I don't know. Actually, the, the best picture of him was done by the, uh, well, there's the one on my website, um, that the best uh, one uh, generally published is the one on the Japanese cover. He is a huge man standing about six foot eight, you know, weighing well over 400 pounds, all of it muscle. Um, he has black hair, black eyes, a black goatee type, not, not goatee, a Van Dyke mustache, mustache and beard. Um, he is not only strong, but extremely intelligent, very technically skilled. Basically, he's a Superman. He's a Doc Smith Superman, which means that there's pretty much nothing he can't do and do very well compared to most people. Um, he was one of the people in the original Hyperion Project that first saw through the illusions and realized that somehow there was something wrong, that he wasn't in a real world, no matter how much it looked real. That's how competent he is. He was able to see through virtual um, a virtual world that was enough to fool many, 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 many other people into thinking that it was real. And he is, he is Ariane's closest advisor, um, along with Simon Sanderson. And he is also Wukong's close friend. Wu Kung is somebody very important to him because of Wu's innocence. Wu is always the one that they relied on to tell them that they were doing the right thing because he had a very simple look at things. Um, he didn't confuse himself with complex motivations. It was just, this is, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. This is how things work. Well, um, tell, and tell us about our, our heroine, Arian. Um she is uh if if duquesne's a super uh man she's she's a super woman in many ways she's a synthesizer of many things she's 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 the classic person thrown in over their heads and forced to swim ariane starts out as nothing more than a pilot she's a really 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 good racing pilot so she has good reflexes absolutely nerves of steel and she does air racing, ground racing, space racing. Um, she's reasonably technically competent. I mean, she understands the technology that she uses in a general fashion. And uh, she's quite fast. She's, for a woman, she's very strong. 
but she's not a superwoman in that sense. She is nothing like Duquesne. Physically, she's um, actually no more dangerous than many of the other people in her crew. But what she has is, and she doesn't realize it until she's pushed into it, she has a basic talent for leadership. When she's certain of what she's doing and what she wants to have done, people listen to her. Even people who are stronger, faster, smarter than her listen to her. She dominates a room. Even She can even boss around Duquesne, and as Duquesne himself says, there aren't many people in the universe that can get away with that. Um, she is forced to become more than she was. In some ways, she becomes that in a very literal sense um, at the end of Grand Central Arena when she triggers the, the what they call awakening and becomes somebody with the same powers as the Shade Weavers and the Faith. However, neither side is going to teach her unless she joins them, and she's not going to join either one, so they seal her powers away. One of the main points of Challenges of the Deeps is that she is desperately trying to figure out how she's going to learn about these powers and unlock them, because otherwise the other sides have considerable advantages and that they can use these powers and she cannot, even though she has them in her. Um, other than that, her main the main thing that makes her important is the way that she does command things, that she commands loyalty, and that she has she has the willpower to drive through any obstacle that's put in her way, perhaps more than anyone else in that in, in the book. And there's nobody in there that doesn't have a lot of willpower. But if any of them is more than the other, that's Ariane. She just keeps going. And Wu Kang is devoted to her as her bodyguard. Yep, he was assigned to her, and when Wu Kang makes an assignment, it is absolute. He will die rather than fail to fulfill that. And as time goes on, he develops a personal affection for her. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the, the second, the big, uh, the big uh, story of the book, which is um, this trip that Orphan wants Arion and a select few to take with him into the deeps. Uh, so what are the deeps of the arena? The deeps are the spaces that are far away from any known um, sphere. Basically, they're the unexplored parts of the arena where there are no known intelligent races that dominate them, and therefore they're far away from any resources to help you as well as to hinder you. Um, depending on where you are in the deeps, especially if there are parts of the deeps that you have to cross through in order to reach other parts of the arena, you could encounter pirates or other hostile types trying to take advantage of the fact that you are separated from your large and your large militaries or others who might protect you, and, and they therefore can risk opposing people, attacking them, and trying to, well, kill them and take their stuff. They have many other threats in the deeps because you don't know what's there. There could be ancient ruins of civilizations that are long forgotten even by the oldest members of the arena. There could be even traces of the void builders themselves, people think. Or there could be creatures you've never encountered and ones that can threaten you. There are predators in the arena of such titanic size that they can threaten main-sized battleships. So they are very dangerous places. They are uncharted. Uh, you can't map them easily. Finding your way through them is partly a matter of guesswork and instinct. Um, so they are, they are places of great risk, places where fortunes can be made or where lives are lost. And uh, they hold, uh, they hold. In addition to scary things, they hold perhaps things like uh, Prospero's Island and uh, the other great mystery places um, that explorers might find. There are indeed vast mysteries, things where you can learn or be changed or even destroyed by what you encounter. Um, one of the things about Orphan, he's called the Survivor. 
He has three times traveled into the deeps with various organizations or groups and been the only one to come back alive. He's done this three times. Mm -hmm. People are somewhat afraid to go with him because of this. Yeah, it's a it's a mark of Arian's faith After. in him that uh, that she agrees to accompany him, right? <laughs> well, it's partly a matter of honor. He they owe him, no matter how how many other things he may have done that annoyed them. Ultimately, they owe him, and they promised him that they would help him. This is the help that he needs, so she's going to carry through on it. Mm -hmm. As as I mentioned before. Carrying through on your obligations in the arena is a tremendously important thing. It means a great deal to your honor, to, your, to the face that you have in the arena and the way in which other people will treat you. But Thorfinn also tells them that there is a good possibility that where they are going, there will be answers for Ariane's major question about the powers that she has locked within her. Because he has, he points out that it's to do with a device that he demonstrated was capable of resisting the power of a shade weaver. So that hinted to them already that it had something to do with the power that was at least equal to a shade weaver's. Mm -hmm. We should also just mention Simon and uh, who's a fascinating character in his own right. Uh, just speaking of all the major characters. Uh, yeah. Dr. Simon Sanderson. Uh, he is the inventor of the Sanderson drive, the faster-than-light drive that gets everybody into this trouble. And while, of course, that doesn't make him unique in the arena's history, since obviously every single species there, with the exception of the Genasi, had to have somebody invent that drive to get them into the arena in the first place, he's the only one living, and one of very, very, very few even in the history, to have come there himself on the first trip. So that, by, by, that led to him attracting the attention of the analytic because it made him a very unusual person uh, who might have unique knowledge on the uh, design and development of a drive. So he has become close friends with Relgolf, no, Relgolf Novnikarf, who is the uh, head of the analytic. Simon is otherwise a normal human being, or was until he was in the middle of the ritual that was supposed to seal Ariane's powers. The ritual was momentarily disrupted. Nobody else really noticed exactly what happened because they're all busy being affected by the disruption. But all the power that was in the entire sealing array, including that from Ariane, from the Shade Weavers, and the Faith, converged on Simon. He didn't know what it did to him for quite a while, but as time has gone on, he's discovered that what it does is basically given him a power which seems to allow him to access the data of the arena, uh, allow him to <coughs> simply know the answer to a question. And while this is an amazing capability, it's also terrifying because the potential power that it offers is beyond frightening, especially since we already have said multiple times that information and secrets are the most powerful weapons in the arena. Here, he seems to have been handed all of them if he wants to look for them. And he doesn't, he's afraid that he might become something inhuman or beyond human and then lose his humanity if he indulges the power, right? Very afraid of that. A few times, he's very afraid of that. The few times that he's used it, he feels that way. He can suddenly see and understand an entire planet as like he's holding it in his hand. And he's terrified that maybe he won't shut it off. Maybe he'll become so used to this or need it so much because he's a scientist. He wants the answers. He wants to understand the universe, and here it is. So he's terrified that this will drive him to a point that he isn't human anymore, that his mind is beyond human. And that's one reason why he's extremely reluctant to use it. You know, it's it's one of these ultimate weapons that you're afraid will have bad effects. He does use it, but he's very reluctant to do so and remains cautious even through the third book. Yeah. And finally, um, 
there's something interesting about humanity that becomes obvious that we're not exactly like other species in the arena in some crucial ways. And um, just, I mean, can you give us some portentous words about what this, <laughs> without spoilers, what this might mean for humanity's survival in, in this ultimate world of life and death gaming? Well, on the surface, the special nature of humanity is an advantage. It's something that we will, that, you know, as it becomes clear in the, in the book, gives us an edge over pretty much any other species. Um, and it was hinted at even starting from the very beginning um, in things, for example, like the fact that we don't seem to be bothered by high odds against us. We don't seem to calculate the odds and we don't seem to care about them too much as a species, as, a, you know, individuals, of course, do, but as a species, we sort of just, eh, I got this, and it works out for us. Um, in a greater sense, though, the it turns out that that power, that special nature, could turn out to be a threat because it could attract people's attention, um, possibly even set people against us. And or it could even attract the attention of forces that we don't know yet. Um, we get hints of that later on in Challenges of the Deeps as to what sort of forces those might be. The, the arena is ancient. Nobody knows how old. One of the things that's interesting is that in some ways we know it is older even than the oldest current species. Yet. It doesn't appear that they know too much about what happened before the oldest current species. So something is happening that keeps people from having records and knowledge that go back hundreds of millions of years. What is it? We don't know. But it must be something pretty impressive if it's managing to do that, given the capabilities of most of the species we know in the arena. Mm. And uh, what – I'm just curious um... – has maybe a culminating question is, do you remember uh, your inspiration for the arena and how this came to you or did it develop over time? What was, uh, what was the genesis of, of this extremely cool idea? Well, there were several genesises, so to speak. Uh, the first one was actually, I was having a discussion with uh, Eric about like, you know, what the next step is uh, you know, I, I didn't have any solo works in in the works at the time, and I was trying to think of what to propose. Um, and Eric made a suggestion of, you know, he was always thinking about something or it'd be like a, a central meeting location of aliens. And that sparked a memory in me of something that I'd invented years and years ago, which is sort of like an interdimensional bar where every every hero and villain of every space could come and visit. Um, the combination of those two became the, the genesis of the arena. Originally, I thought of it as being you, your ship would pop into sort of a berth, a docking space in what became Nexus Arena, and you just get out of your ship and walk out of this room, and there you were. But as I worked on it, I realized, but wait a minute, the practicalities of this, I'm not quite seeing how I get to another solar system. What, am I going to have to pick up my ship and carry it to another berth? And I was trying to figure out how you would get from one point to another and all that. And I was thinking, you know, it'd be sort of like what I really want is something that's sort of like islands and how they're going and how they connect to each other. But, you know, so you could sail from one to another. And then all of a sudden I remembered Roger Dean's paintings, the, uh, the ones for the group. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and how it showed the mountains floating in air with uh, with water cascading off of them. And I suddenly realized that, that, that's what I'm looking for. That's what the arena is. That whole space with every one of those floating islands is a solar system. It connects to a solar system. And so you go from one island to another through the spaces between. That was the inspiration for what made the arena the way that it is today and the idea of the place where all of the uh, all the heroes of fiction and, and myth met 
triggered the idea when it became Hyperion, of course. Um, although uh, it's a lot less cheerful than my original idea was. <laughs> Hyperion is, is a grand tragedy in, in a, on a scale that's truly epic. Yeah. And while some of the results of Hyperion are really good for humanity in the long run, it's still one of the most horrific chapters in humanity's history uh, in the universe. Yeah. Well, the book is Challenges of the Deep by Reiki Sports, a new and climatic entry in the uh, incredibly rich, complex, and uh, incredibly fun and um, and adventurous Arenaverse series, and it's now at booksellers everywhere. Reich, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me in again. Now we continue with our complete Audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 28 The Matrix Between Coursera and HH1509270 Daniel loved the blazing splendor of the Matrix, and he found discussions with Adele to be informative and generally delightful. A discussion with Adele on the hull while a ship was in the Matrix was private, the only place you could expect privacy on a starship, but brought with it the nagging worry that Adele was somehow going to drift off into a universe which wasn't meant for human beings or even for life. Adele was tethered to a ring bolt on the hull and by a second safety line to Daniel's rigging suit. Daniel could not imagine how she might become separated from him or the ship, but Adele had done quite a number of things which no one else could imagine. Most of them were good, but she really had proven remarkably clumsy on shipboard. Radios couldn't be used in the Matrix without throwing a starship incalculably off course. Daniel touched one end of his communications rod to Adele's helmet, then moved his own helmet firmly against the other end. The rods were of hollow brass and filled with a dense liquid. Artificers on the Bantry estate had made them to Daniel's direction when he realized he needed some better way of holding discussions on the hull than by pressing his helmet against that of the other party. Daniel hadn't directed old Fogelman and his assistant to engrave the rods with the leery arms or to chase them with fine arabesques, but he hadn't been surprised to see the embellishments. The tenants and craftsmen of Bantry took pride in their jobs, knowing that the squire took pride in them. What's your guess as to why Sorley took Cleveland? Daniel asked. The rod provided a medium in which sound vibration could travel between the hard surface of one helmet to the hard surface of another. The discussion wasn't really secret, but Daniel preferred to keep speculations away from the crew. Uncertainty made spacers nervous. Known dangers, including the risks of going into battle and simply the natures of their jobs, weren't nearly so worrisome. Sorley may plan to return to Corsera when his ship is repaired, and to use Cleveland to find the treasure according to the original plan, Adele said. I consider this less likely than that he will go to Cinnabar and demand a ransom from Mistress Sand and her husband. The Kaisha's antennas rotated thirty degrees. That changed the angle at which the fabric of the electrically charged sails impinged on the Casimir radiation, which was the sole constant throughout every bubble universe in the cosmos. Reflexively, Daniel looked up to observe the rig. The top sails and top gallants were set, but another mechanically transmitted command reefed the latter by a batten each. The starboard top gallant caught, so a rigger climbed quickly to clear the bulky sheave. 
I suppose he could hold Cleveland on some world which the Republic doesn't control, Daniel mused aloud. He hadn't let either end of the rod slip out of contact when he turned to watch the course change. Even plaisance, I suppose. I don't think the truce means that Garantor Pora would be willing to do a favor for Mistress Sand. Captain Sorley would be a marked man no matter where he went afterward, Adele said. He and all his crew. Mistress Sand has a long memory, and so do I. But I've seen no evidence that Sorley understands the concept of long-term consequences. There was a tick of sound that didn't quite transfer through the communication rod. It was probably a sniff. Or not such long-term, Daniel said. I'll make a priority of looking for Sorley if things go wrong. But that's if we don't find Cleveland when we make Planetfall tomorrow, as I hope and expect we will. The heavens blurred as the Kaisha slipped from one universe to another. The pattern reformed, almost identical to what it had been before, except that the apparent colors had shifted lower in the spectrum. Daniel knew he wasn't seeing true colors. Universes didn't emit light into the matrix but his brain was displaying relative energy levels in a form that his mind was used to reading. Because the Kaisha had entered a universe of higher energy than the one she had left, the appearance of the cosmos changed in accordance. Adele, he said, when I'm out here, I really feel that everything in the cosmos is part of a single machine, and I'm one of those pieces. It's not power, it's purpose. Everything has purpose. I'm not religious myself, Adele said. For an instant, Daniel thought that she had changed the subject, but of course she had not. I think it would be a fine thing to have purpose, Adele said. I'm not sure how I could tell, though. I can't think of any objective data which I would regard as evidence. Daniel watched the heavens ablaze with all majesty, all existence. Adele, he said, what do you see here in the Matrix? Anything? I think there's a pattern, Adele said after a moment. I don't see it, though, which is very frustrating. I do better with data, I'm afraid. The communication rod twitched. Adele had shrugged in her air suit, but she brought her helmet back into contact as soon as she realized. I don't believe some questions have answers, she said. So I prefer not to think about them. I'm more useful looking for information about this world where we hope to find sorely. I wish it had a name, Daniel said, frowning. Calling something HH1509270 is cumbersome at best. I suppose we could call it Cleveland's World, said Adele, or Sorley's Grave if things don't work out. Daniel laughed, though if Tovera had made the statement, he wouldn't have been sure it was a joke. He chose to believe that Tovera's mistress had meant a joke, though. Daniel, Adele said, if we find the Madison merchant in orbit instead of being on the ground, will you fight him? If we find her at all, that is. Daniel frowned, letting his soul drift in the cosmos while his conscious mind went over that question again. We might get away with it, he said. Our pop gun isn't going to penetrate the hull of a 3,000-ton freighter like the Madison Merchant, so we won't risk hitting Cleveland. Even to a trap that's in bad shape, we're no danger. The problem, of course, is that the Merchant mounts a four-inch cannon herself. I haven't found much information on the ship's personnel, Adele said. I copied the crew list when we were dealing with the situation in Xenos, but I can only cross-reference it against databases on Cinnabar. None of the names I found have a gunner's rating in their background, but there are 20 of the crew on whom I have no information, at least under the names they're using now. It's unlikely that the merchant will have a competent gunner, Daniel said, voicing the sequence of thoughts that had been caroming off the sides of his mind for some hours. They almost certainly won't have a gunner as good as Sun. Those are probabilities. The certainties are on Sorley's side. A four-inch gun against our two-inch and the merchant's much sturdier hull and frames. He looked at the Matrix and the glowing, splendid universes there. They aren't looking down on me. I'm here with them, Daniel thought. But this decision is for me, not for the cosmos. I think it'd probably turn out all right, he said aloud. But I'm not going to gamble the lives of my crew on a chance when I think there'll be better opportunities later. If we find the merchant in orbit... I'll wait and act according to what Sorley decides to do. 
If he inserts, we'll follow him in the Matrix. I don't think he'll believe that's possible, since we have a good chance of taking him unaware when he extracts again. If you'll give me a list of possible alternative destinations, Adele said, I'll see what additional information I can find to add to what the sailing directions say. The sails were adjusting. The main courses fluttered down silently. They normally remained furled. They had greater surface area than sails higher up the antennas, but they provided less leverage for turning a ship in the matrix. We'll go inside now, Daniel said as he reached the decision. I'll get you that list. Instead of walking toward the airlock at once, he paused to look again at the matrix. He replaced the communications rod firmly against Adele's helmet. You know, Daniel said, there are only two places where I really feel content. In the Matrix and on Bantry. And I can't stay either place for very long. Life itself is temporary, Daniel, Adele said. She started for the airlock. Daniel followed, making sure that there was only the right amount of slack in the safety line. Adele was right, of course. It doesn't feel temporary here, though or when I'm relaxing after a celebration with the tenants. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a ringing in the celestial spheres, plus a great bellowing of ergot approving laughter from the deeps, as well as the thanks and praise of us ordinary mortals for Raiki Spore, author of Challenges of the Deeps. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 